Hello, everybody, and happy Easter. So glad that you are with us online today for this. If we were together in person, I would follow that age-old Christian tradition and greet you with a, He is risen, and you would respond by saying, He is risen indeed. But since we're not together, we can follow that much more recent tradition, and you can pick up your cell phone and text somebody, He is risen, and see if they might not respond with a, He is risen indeed. That mode may have changed that we're communicating with, but the truth is the same as ever. And it still is, is such a cause for joy. This is the biggest celebration that we have in Christianity, this, this recognition of Jesus rising from the dead. And if you are new to New Day, if this is your first time finding us, welcome. We're so glad that you've, you've tracked us down online. And if all this talk about Easter is new to you and you don't understand it, uh, we have prepared a little ebook called Uppercase Hope that is just a basic, plain English description of, of Easter and Christianity and what it's all about. And uh, you can find that on our website, newdaynw.com. You don't have to sign up or give us your email or anything. It is just a free download right there on the homepage. And we'd love for that to be our gift to you this Easter. And while you're on our website, if you wanted, you can also register for our next in-person gathering, which will be in two weeks on April 18th. And that'll take place down at our office and meeting space called the hub that's in Browns Point. And we have two service times for this one. So there should be plenty of room for whoever would like to be there for that. But please register and let us know uh, that you'd like to be there. We'd love to see you there for that. But today I would love to just open us up in prayer and, and uh, thank God for, for what it is that we're celebrating today. Would you join with me as we, as we begin? God, we are so, so thankful to know uh, your power that is represented in the resurrection, to know the incredible truth that it tells us of um, your forgiveness for us, of your love for us, and, and what it means for us just getting through life today in these very different, strange times. Um, so God, I pray that our time together today would serve to deepen our understanding of what those events so long ago did and what they mean for now. And I pray that it will just expand expand our, our hearts to receive the love that you have for us, that you want us to know uh, because you want relationship with us. So God, use all of this together for our good and for your glory. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is a celebration of power, the power to bring life out of death and an act that leaves us breathless, the power to reverse a curse and into sin, the God alone who could move a stone and tell the world, he is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah for the resurrection. But he didn't just roll back a rock. Let's turn back the clock and see where true power hung in the air for hours. Astounding love overcoming depravity, a force so strong it defied gravity and held Christ to that cross till the job was done, the battle won because God's own son didn't run. He stayed. Staying power. The power of staying in one spot. Now that's the beginning of our salvation when Christ refused to use his station, when he could have called angels and come down from that tree. Three nails were not the reason he didn't break free. One word from him is all it would take and heaven itself would pull up the stakes and rush to his side, his precious bleeding side, and it would be all over. The enemy denied his short shot of pride if Christ hadn't died. But that's not what happened. He didn't come down. He stayed and he felt every thorn in that crown, every thorn, every scorn, every muscle now torn as the pain of the world pressed in. He felt it all, didn't try to escape, 
didn't pry himself loose to get out of the hate. He remained present in the moment, aware, walking straight without fear into blackest despair. So unfair and yet unbelievably true. Christ's priceless gift for us is what he didn't do because he didn't come down. He stayed through the worst, the first person ever to take on the curse and reverse it till life burst through and death was defeated and the world became new. Bring it back to today, to today's celebration as we think and we sing and reflect on salvation and all creation gives a standing ovation for Jesus, the lamb who stayed. What can we say? Think of how we all live, the messes we make, the excuses we give, the things that we do when the pain pierces through. How fast do we run to leave it behind? The wounds that sting and the chains that bind. Cause we're blind to the joy of the one who waits, ready to meet us in our darkest place. The Jesus who stayed is staying even now. Easter's the promise assuring us how the Jesus who died is the Jesus who lives, who never will leave or forsake or forget or move on or let go or abandon his own. He'll stay by your side till you're finally home. So sometimes when I go up to see our son Addison who lives in Seattle, I'll typically drive up there on the weekend and so I'll try to catch the TED Radio Hour while I'm in the car. That's just a compilation of the highlights from various TED Talks. And I heard one a couple weeks ago that was fascinating. It was a story of a man named Oscar Duhalde. And back in 1987, Oscar was working as a telescope operator at Las Campanas Observatory high in the Andes Mountains in Chile. And he'd been working a really long day. This was in February. And he went outside for a break at two in the morning. And he's looking up at the starry sky and he notices something that he's pretty sure looks different. And in that moment, Oscar Duhalde became the only living person on the planet to discover a supernova with his naked eye. No instruments, no telescope, just observation. Now a supernova, you could define as the dramatic increase in the brightness of a star, one billion times the brightness of the sun. That that brightness that comes at the catastrophic end of its life. And you would think that that sort of brightness would be easy to spot in the sky, but it was far more challenging than it might sound. Uh, He spotted this supernova in what's known as the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is the galaxy nearest to us. And so here's a picture of what that cloud looked like before the supernova. And here's what it looked like right after. A little hard to spot, isn't it? That's it right there, that, that one little slightly brighter area. Now... Even that, uh, you don't really get a sense on how difficult this was because this is a zoomed in shot. But if you look at the sky that, that Oscar would have seen that night, uh, it's pretty spectacular. A few more stars than you see in Federal Way. And, and you can see that cloud there and how small it is and how far away it looks and just how incredible it is that somebody could notice with their own eye Uh, any kind of difference in that at all. But Oscar knew this cloud well. He studied it regularly and and was able to pick up on that. Well, we're talking about the resurrection today. And in my mind, the resurrection is like a supernova because it is this incredibly bright event that comes at the catastrophic end of the earthly life of Christ. Christ. And we have all these Oscar Duhaldes in the disciples as they were eyewitnesses to this event. They saw Jesus in person. How incredible that must have been. And I want to look with you at some of their story today. Of course, Mary Magdalene was the the first person to see Jesus. 
She, she met him on the morning of his resurrection in the garden, and, and she ran to tell the other disciples, and they weren't sure what to make of her story. It, it did not compute with them. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. And then Jesus came and appeared to them directly himself. And that's what I want to look at with you today. Here's, here's the, the story as it's recorded for us in the book of John. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. That's a pretty brief description of this encounter. And honestly, this is not one of the Easter stories that I'm normally drawn to simply because there's not as much happening in it. And yet this year, as I read through it, it sounded different in my ears. As I thought back over the last 12 months and all that we've been through, this story resonated with me in a new way. We could probably do one of our unofficial breakouts at this point and give you a chance to answer that question for yourself. What has this last year been like? How would you describe it? What are the adjectives or maybe the expletives that come to mind? For me, the words that I associate with this year are collective trauma because we have been through this distressing experience, are still going through it together, and it's been so full of grief and loss and anxiety and anger and fear and just intensity ongoing and so much uncertainty. And so when I think about all of that and then I look at this experience of these disciples, and granted the circumstances were very different, but I, I can see something familiar in them and go, oh, they have experienced collective trauma as they have witnessed the arrest of Jesus and that sham of a trial and then his horrifically unjust execution. And it was also fast and violent and bewildering. And they're reeling from it. They are in shock. And now they are huddled together, locked away. I saw that, that France is back in lockdown again right now. And I was thinking about that whole idea of of lockdown and what does it mean? It means that we perceive a threat and we're trying to protect ourselves. And that's what these disciples were trying to do. They were in this self-imposed lockdown because they knew that the same people who had executed Jesus are still out there. And if they went after the leader, chances are they might go for the followers as well. And so they are terrified and they're, they're hiding away, trying to stay out of sight. And it's in that setting where Jesus comes to them. And even the way Jesus arrives tells us something. Because he didn't come and knock on the door and say, hey guys, let me in, it's me. And he didn't throw open the door and just make some big dramatic entrance. He appeared among them without even needing a door. And this is the first clue to the disciples that resurrection is different from resuscitation. It's different. You know, resuscitation would have been if somebody had, had taken the paddles to Jesus and just sort of brought him back to that pre-crucified state. But this looks entirely new. Jesus is operating in a different way. He's not bound and restricted by the same laws of nature in the way that he was before. He's operating differently, and, and it tells them as he comes to them that things are not the same anymore. If there was any illusion in their minds that if they just had Jesus back, they could go back to the good old days, go traveling around to all the villages, see him heal people and listen to him preach, 
that's gone. That is not coming back again. So even though they're overjoyed that Jesus is back to them, it's going to look different. It's never going to be the same. Any nostalgic sentimentality for, for that sweet time that they had had has to be put aside as they learn to face a new world that's not looking anything like what it had before. And that, to me, also is why this story speaks so precisely to where we're at right now. Because one thing that we know is that life is not going back to the way it was before this pandemic. Carrie Newhoff, who's a consultant for churches and pastors and sort of a future thinker, posted this on his blog recently. He said, the world is increasingly unstable and will likely be that way for a long time. Uh, I'm a creature of habit. I like my routines. I like that sense of predictability. And that's all been taken away to some degree. But the good thing is that this passage speaks directly to times like this. And even though the world may never be the same, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that means we can look at the way he encountered these disciples. And since we know that he is here and alive today, we can know that the message for them is the same as the message for us. His heart is the same. His personality is the same. His will is the same for us. So what I want to look at with you today are some gifts that I think Jesus gave to them in their world that had been completely overturned, a world that was in upheaval, and say, what are the gifts of a resurrected Jesus that applied then that can apply to our world that is also in upheaval? And the first thing I would say is that a resurrected Jesus settles our alarmed hearts and minds. What are the first words out of Jesus' mouth in this story? Peace be with you. What are the second words out of his mouth? Also, peace be with you. He repeats himself. In the past, I might have read those words and just sort of skipped over them like a throwaway line. But now, can you think of anything that our world could benefit more from, or anything that our own souls could benefit more from than to have the peace of Christ himself settle on us. Isn't that what we long for? Isn't that the, the healing balm that our wounds need? Christ says, yes, this peace is here for you. And he's not just saying empty words. It's not just a nice gesture or thought. Think about the context in which he's saying this because he is coming to them on the heels of the greatest conflict of his life. It is a hard one thing for him to offer this peace. It has substance to it. It has weight. And as he speaks the words, he also shows them his hands and his side. And that's not just to prove who he is. That is to point them to the work that he has done on the cross. And to say, that is the source of the peace that I'm talking about. Colossians says that, that Christ made peace for us by his blood on the cross. He fashioned it. He generated it. He created it out of nothing. It didn't exist before then. And the way he did that was by taking up on himself all that was broken between humanity and God. He took all the weight of our guilt. He took our sin. He took our rebellion. He took our punishment on himself. He absorbed it and, and removed it, took it out of the way, and said, now the way is open for you to be reconciled with God. There is nothing to get in that gap. And so all the existential dread that we feel and don't understand, that we don't even know that it's about that, Jesus takes that on himself and takes it out of the way. And it's not just only peace in that relationship. It's also peace in our circumstances that the resurrection speaks to. I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, I would challenge you to think of any event in any time in history that is worse 
than the crucifixion. Any, any example of a miscarriage of justice that exceeds what we see when the author of life is killed, when the innocent son of God who has never done anything wrong in his entire life is punished for everything wrong in the universe. That's as bad as it gets. It doesn't get any worse. And yet, God took that. He took that very worst thing and he used that in his salvation plan. He made it into something different. He fashioned it in a way that said it did not exceed his control at all. The, the resurrection shows us what it is that God is capable of doing with the very worst. Dorothy Sayers once wrote, God did not abolish the fact of evil. He transformed it. He did not stop the crucifixion. He rose from the dead. If that's what God can do with the cross, then I can trust anything that I am going through into his care. I can have genuine peace, whatever is happening, however different the world looks from what I thought it ought to look like. We can all have the kind of peace that allows us to stay our untriggered, grown-up selves in the face of anything life throws at us. We may not like it, but we can accept it and allow it and not feel like we need to run away or we need to resist it in some sense. Uh, but we can, we can occupy that space of trust that goes along with peace because of Jesus specifically being risen from the dead. I think another thing that the resurrected Jesus gives us is that he expands our capacity for change. Okay, take a look at the text again. It says, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Makes you think of when God created Adam and he breathed into him the breath of life. Jesus is breathing life into his disciples. And this is the key. This is what is going to give them everything they need for this uncertain future that's out ahead. You know, we can feel bad for them and what they lost in terms of their earthly experience of Jesus and that sweet time that they had. But this is far, far better. What he's giving them here is, is way greater. Jesus is saying, look, I was next to you. I was nearby and, and, and with you in that capacity. But now I'm going to take my own spirit, my very presence, and place it inside your heart. You are going to have me that close, that accessible, that knowable. And I will stay with you there and show you even more of myself than ever. And, and this is just a little preview because it's not just for the disciples. This is what will be true for all believers of all time. We're told in Scripture that as we put our faith in Jesus, He grants us that same Spirit. That Spirit then lives in our hearts, the Spirit that raised Him from the dead to lead us and, and be our encourager and our comforter, and our counselor, and our convictor, and our teacher, to, to show us more and more of who God is, and to be that close and permanent in our lives. And maybe you're listening to that, and you go, I don't know what it's like to have the Holy Spirit in my heart. And you want that. It's very, very simple. It's just a matter of asking for it. It's just saying, yes, Jesus, I believe that what you did on the cross was for me, that that barrier that you took out of the way is mine. I, I want that peace with God. I need that forgiveness. Please come in. And when we, when we invite him in, he tells us that he comes in and he stays and he never leaves. And he gives us that spirit to remind us of that relationship that we have with God. That is a constant presence with us, no matter what our circumstances are. Those are going to continue to change. And, and it's the Holy Spirit that enables us not only to navigate that change, but also to be changed ourselves. Because uh, like, with, like with Adam and like with the disciples, 
the spirit is is a life within us and it and life grows and and the spirit is is growing in us like a tree we're told that the spirit produces fruit in our lives love joy peace patience kindness gentleness self-control these things all begin to appear more and it doesn't matter what sort of circumstances we're we're facing good bad or indifferent they all become fertilizer to help that that growth and we've seen that over and over again you know this last year uh, of, of all my time serving as a pastor it's never been easy for me the role has always been challenging and this year has has pressed in on me more and more again my own inadequacies my own lack of understanding and knowing what to do over and over again and and that constant presence of the Holy Spirit uh, being aware daily that he is with me is is what has enabled me to continue going uh, it has been absolutely vital to to recognize Christ's presence through all of this and we've seen that collectively as a church too as there have been so many things that have been outside of our control and and we have seen again and again how the Holy Spirit has shown up in our gatherings you know we're having these very small in-person times of worship at the hub small times of prayer and it looks so much different than having a large group together but it's been some of the best church ever as the holy spirit has shown up again and again and fed us and led us into more truth this is this is one of the biggest gifts that the resurrected jesus gives us is the presence of his spirit and and it is absolutely vital that that we need him so much right now in this time and as we look ahead to times that we don't even know what's coming um, to be able to count on christ's own presence with us is such a gift well one final thing that the resurrected jesus gives us is he entrusts us with god's own work this is to me one of the most surprising elements in this story that at this moment in time that Jesus chooses to endow his disciples with this power of forgiveness. That he says to them, I am giving you the ability to forgive one another in a way that is meaningful and that sticks. Because if I was one of the disciples in the room that day, I'd be confused by this. Why is he talking about this right now? I understand why he brought up peace, because I need that. And I could appreciate uh, why he would want to give us his spirit, that would have value to me. But I'm not thinking about who to forgive right now. And what I would want to hear from, from Jesus is that he's giving us courage or, or fearlessness in the face of all these opponents or the right words to win the arguments or that he's giving us a, a safe hiding place, anything, all these other things. And so why talk about forgiveness right now? But when I bring this into our own context today, it makes all kinds of sense. Because I go, what could be more needed right now than modeled forgiveness? When you think about this last year and all the hurts that have happened, you think about all the ways people have been offended by each other, all the ways we've canceled one another, and been critical and judgmental and there's been so much division and distrust what would it look like for the church to take seriously this power that we've been granted this this godlike power of forgiveness because jesus says we can implement this really broadly and indiscriminately because he says whoever we forgive is forgiven what could that look like? I mean, I think for myself, I can be so stingy with forgiveness because I want to hold on to a grudge and I want people to be punished. I want, I want them to pay for what they did wrong and I don't want to let them off the hook. And, and I can be withholding when it comes to forgiveness. And I think sometimes we can get the entirely wrong idea of what it means to forgive because because we get in our heads that it's being too easy 
on people. And that somehow it's, it's not honoring what's happened. And Jesus would say to us, you know what, I take your wound, I take this hurt even more seriously than you do. I absolutely believe that it's so wrong that it needs justice and that it needs to be punished. And you know what, I've taken all that punishment on on myself already. That's what the cross is about. I have collected up all these wounds, everything bad that's happened, and I've said, yes, this is important and needs to be dealt with. And so I've dealt with it myself. So, so we can release and let go of that idea that we somehow need to exact an extra price from people. We need retribution in some way. We can set that down because Christ has picked it all up. And so if we are finding that we are having a difficult time forgiving somebody, we can pray and ask God to enlarge our understanding of the cross in light of that. And, and, and yes, we, we still may call people to account and ask them to, to deal with the, um, the repercussions and the consequences that flow from their actions, but we don't need to hold it over their heads for, for more punishment. We can, we can forgive freely. What would it look like for us as a church to lean in as hard as we can into this power and say, the world needs forgiveness. The world needs agents of mercy and grace who embody this truth. Can we be as liberal as possible in our forgiveness in the way that we extend it to everybody that, that crosses us in some way? What would it look like? to believe that this power is really ours. There have been a couple of questions that I think have been on all of our minds in this last year. The first one being, who's safe? We're just not sure when we look around, especially with COVID, all the rules that have changed. You know, I had a, a teacher in high school, a science teacher, and I don't remember much of the class, but on the first day, he made a point of saying, Hot metal is the same color as cold metal. Meaning sometimes you can't look at something and tell whether it's safe or dangerous. And we can't, we can't really be sure when, when we're interacting whether somebody's asymptomatic or not. And so we're not sure if we're gonna get somebody else sick or get sick ourselves. We're just not sure what's safe physically in that way. And sometimes we haven't been sure this year who's safe to talk to. I remember last summer having a conversation with an African-American friend of mine who was saying that he wished that, that white people had some sort of visible sign on them that he could look at and know who was safe because he was feeling so much fear. And there, there are leaders that we trusted who have fallen this year in the church and we go, ah, I thought you were a safe person that I could rely on. It turns out not. So we're not sure who's safe. And secondly, we aren't sure what's true. What's true? There have been so many opinions on everything out there right now and so accessible to us. We are bombarded with different points of view all the time. And not only that, there's this false information layered on top of it and conspiracy theories to a point where I'll talk to people and they go, you know what? I just don't believe anything anymore because I can't figure out what is true. The good news about Easter is that Christ is safe and Christ is the truth. We can always count on him. We can always rely on him. No matter how much the world is changing, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that same means that he is 100% safe and reliable and 100% truth. I read an article this week by an author named Alan Cross who uh, was talking in it, reflecting on the loss of his dad to COVID this year in light of Easter, thinking about how those two thoughts fit together. And he was remembering back, his, his dad had been sick for much of his life, had a degenerative bone disease. And so when this author was, was a kid, he's a middle-aged man now, but when he was back 10 or 11 years old, he remembered going to church with his dad and standing there next to his dad 
standing and singing in worship. And he looked over at his dad and his face was beet red and it was covered with sweat and his tears were coming down. He was in so much pain. And afterwards he asked his dad, he said, Dad, why, why do you put yourself through this? Why do you keep going to church? And his dad said, I am in so much pain and, and so distraught that I have to go. I'm in, I'm in too much pain not to go. And he said, I need Jesus. Jesus is all I have. Jesus is good and Jesus is enough. And Alan Cross wrote and said, I carry that message with me, that good news, even through this year of plague, when I lost my father, Jesus is good. Jesus is enough. That's the hope of Easter, that no matter what we have been through in this last year, and no matter what unknown, unforeseen year lies ahead, no matter how much the world has changed or continues to change, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus is good. Jesus is enough. I want to leave you today not with a prayer, but with a benediction, a blessing that has, I guess, become somewhat of an Easter tradition here at New Day. Down through the centuries, priests and pastors have closed out services with benedictions, often holding up their hands with these three fingers representing the Trinity, or these two fingers representing the humanity and divinity of Jesus. But in any case, somewhere along the line, somebody chose to cross these fingers like this to represent the cross, and then to say the words, Christus Victor, Christus Victor, Christus Victor. I said those words on Easter a year ago at the beginning of pandemic, not knowing what we were in for. And I'm here to say them again because Jesus is still the victory. He is still Lord. He's still risen. May you go out today in whatever lies ahead for you in the peace of knowing the brightness of the supernova that is our resurrected Lord. And may you share that hope with all those you encounter. Amen.